Okay, here we go, guys. All right. I'm all the way at the bottom of the show notes. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to discuss the topics of the week and more are Miss Valerie Jardin, or Jardin, or however you want to pronounce that, and Ron Brinkman with two N's. Valerie, one day I'm going to get your, your name right, I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey. Great. Great. How Hello. are you doing? Long time. Uh, I'm doing great. Yeah, you know, Ron. I think you're you you have the honor of being the person that hasn't been on the show in the longest amount of time. What's going on Months. in your world? What's going on in my world? Yes. Um, I did some traveling. I went to several places in Asia, including Singapore and Jeez. then Borneo. Uh, saw some orangutans. Um, got engaged. What? Wow. What? <laughs> No, he puts that at the end. How does how does getting engaged rank below seeing orangutans? <laughs> oh, that's the uh, that's the you know final little bit of the story. We were done seeing the orangutans, and I figured you know. Wait, were you in front of the orangutans and you dropped down on one knee? Is that how it happened? No, we were actually uh, in this little island off the coast of Borneo, which is already an island, and uh, you know tropical paradise sort of a setting. Look at that. It was all very romantic. Oh, thank you. Wow. So. Well, well, that's. I think that news kind of trumps everything that we're going to talk about on this show. <laughs> 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 Wait yes. a minute. It wasn't a shotgun engagement, was it, Ron? Nope. No, <laughs> okay. there's no, no little bambinos on the way that I know of. All right. But, that you uh, know of. I like the little asterisk <laughs> at the end of that. <laughs> None that I'm claiming. Yes. That I right. Cool. Uh, no, so now I'm in. So you know, post that. What I've been up to is nothing but wedding planning because we're actually doing it pretty quickly. So. So you're going to uh, be looking for a wedding photographer. We should make an announcement. Yeah. Well, we can. <laughs> we're we're doing it. We're actually getting married in Hawaii and oh, wow. um, the the in on Kauai and the resort that we're at sort of has a small list of approved photographers. So oh. we don't have a whole lot of leeway for some of this. But I tell you, man, I. Uh, but your engagement always, photos, you could hire somebody local, right? I, I doubt we'll even do them, though. I just, with all the crap we got to do, I don't think we'll even do engagement photos. You're getting off on the wrong foot already, dude. Look at that. <laughs> dude, you know, I, <laughs> with all the crap we got to do, what is this? <laughs> you know, we, we all. We're going to buy a ring now and <laughs> what was yeah, kissing. That, too. <laughs> now, you know, we've, we've all been on the side of the photographer where we have these discussions and it's always like, uh, oh, people don't cheap out on your wedding photographer. Don't, uh, you know, get somebody good. And, <laughs> and when it's suddenly, suddenly, your $100 suddenly, for a disc doesn't sound too bad about this. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know, when you're looking at $10,000 for, uh, the, you know, all of your wedding photography costs, that ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. So, it ain't and, you cheap. know, I get it, but it's a large percentage of the wedding, and obviously it's important, and I want to have it, you know, good. Yeah, and good well, hey, and you waited it. this long, Ron, and you only get married <laughs> once. Come on. You know. I know. And, and so I'm not saying I'm not going to do it, but still, writing that check is, that is a chunk of change. I got to say. Valerie, do you hear this? So... Not only did the engagement come after the orangutans, he's already <laughs> talking about cheaping out on the wedding. <laughs> nah, absolutely not. But uh, all I'm saying is, you know, in the past we've always been like, I mean, our, our listeners would talk about this, right? We'd be like, suck it up, just pay for it, get yeah. somebody good. Yeah. But I'm just saying I have a little bit more sympathy <laughs> for everybody else that has gone through a wedding. You know, if it was just the cost of the photography, that'd be one thing. It's like, great, this is good. But then, you know, it's like every time you turn around, I mean, the wedding industry is such a cash machine anyway. And anytime oh, yeah. they see you coming, it's just like, you know, I'd like to rent this hall for a business meeting. Okay, that'll be $1,000. I'd like to rent this hall for a wedding. Oh, that'll be $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? Well, you're having a wedding. <laughs> well, I think you just saw you just cracked that nut. Just call it a business meeting, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is, right? You know. <laughs> yep. And because yeah. in the end, you're getting married. Oh no, you're getting married in Maui, so it's not a half thing at the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In Kauai, actually. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Kauai. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, welcome back, dude. It's uh, that's great yeah. news. Congratulations, and welcome back. It to is. The show. It's very exciting. So. All right. Yep. Well, Keeping Valerie, busy, what's uh, what's happening on, in your neck of the woods? No engagements, right? No, um, but I'm uh, getting ready to leave again in about three weeks. Um, two more work, two more workshops in France. Um, I have wow. one this weekend in Minneapolis, and I just announced the 2014 workshops, most of them, which includes France, Australia, and the U.S. And 
the, uh, one of the exciting uh, workshops that is new next year is uh, you've interviewed James Mayer from New York, the street mm -hmm. photographer. Mm -hmm. We're getting together and co-leading a street photography workshop in April in New York City. So that's um, that's pretty exciting. That's cool. And yeah. what camera are you going to be shooting? Is it is it that <laughs> Fuji? Both, yeah, actually, James just got his yesterday, so we're both going to be shooting um, street photography with the with the X one hundred S for sure. Wow, yeah. look at that. And he's I same as that. same just... as I I am. He was shooting with a five D Mark two II or three, and then um, switched to the Fuji for street photography. I mean, you can't can't beat that. And can't I watched it. I watched um, Doug. Um, Doug's review on it. Oh, you watched our uh, All About the Gear episode? <laughs> yes, yes. W did you See, agree with I, what he was saying? Can you believe I actually watched something that's all about the gear? I did. <laughs> yeah. And I almost because choked Because it had, when I heard it my had name. Fuji in it, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, and I, I, I agree with most most of what he had to say. So it was interesting. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, Tip listeners, check it out. It's, uh, it's online, actually, on my YouTube channel, All About the Gear. Um, there's a playlist there right now. We may make it into a full podcast uh, but right now it's a it's a YouTube show so definitely check it out it's just Doug and I Doug K and I sitting down and talking about a piece of gear that Barrel Lenses through the uh, the graces of their gigantic gear locker sent over to him to play with for a week or so then we uh, I pepper him with questions about how good it is what the good bad and ugly is and we go from there so it actually works fun Cool. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's jump into the show. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is speaking about gear. This is going to be a gear show. I feel it. Um, mm -hmm. Olympus. So Olympus released the OMD EM1. So this is the next iteration of the OMD. So this guy that I have right here that I am madly in love with. This is the. Uh, oh, this is, I love this thing, that? dude. Huh? When did you get that? Yeah, I have had this for like three months now, I think. So, oh, okay. Wow. And this is my favorite camera of all time. I love this thing. So my, it's the, uh, it's the predecessor to this, to this, uh, this e M1, right? So mm -hmm. what I want to tell, so let me just run down the specs real quick before we dive into what the, what that camera is. And I'll preface all of this with none of us have touched this camera yet because <laughs> it was just released. We've been watching YouTube videos about it and reading articles, but none of us have held it in our hands like this. To uh, to actually form a substantive opinion about it, but we can we can speculate and hypothesize all night long. <laughs> That's what so, we do. This thing has a 16.3 megapixel sensor, um, and I'm just going to skip through these. I'm going to read everything. You can read the exhaustive list on their site. Um, 6.5 frames per second. It's got a a new dual fast autofocus system that allows for quick autofocusing, uh, and that seems redundant. Um, 1080p, 30 frame per second video, which seems standard now. A better, quote, electronic viewfinder. Not sure what that means, but, you know, maybe brighter or larger. It's got an upgraded 5-axis image stabilizer. So this camera, the, the, the current Olympus OMD that I have has, and all of them, not just mine, have a built-in image stabilizer in the body, which is just insanely fantastic. So whatever lens you put on here the image is stabilized and for both still and video. One of the things I heard about this camera, though I'm not sure yet, um, is there may be some differences in there. I don't know, but we'll dive into that. The new one has built-in Wi-Fi. So this one has built-in Wi-Fi through the graces of iFi and their Mobi card, but the new one has built-in Wi-Fi. It's got a dedicated HDR button that I'm kind of on the fence about. I don't know if I want that mm -hmm. dedicated. And it's got a freeze-proof body guaranteed to shoot at temperatures down to 14 degrees. Again, California. I would use that. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where in California it might get down to 14 <laughs> degrees. It will but in Minnesota. If I travel, you know, it might, might do that. So the price is the crazy thing. So <clears throat> it comes in at... <laughs> Thirteen ninety nine or fourteen hundred dollars for just the body, and twenty two hundred dollars when purchased with their twenty with their twelve to forty millimeter two point eight kit lens, and it's supposed to be released or available for you to purchase it next month as we record this, which will be October. Valerie, looking at this crazy specs, it's awesome. You've seen the camera, you see the new form factor. They went away from this kind of retro styling, which I still love of the you know about this camera one of the reasons why why I bought the OMD was the the retro fashioning of the the industrial design they changed that a little bit what do you what do you think overall after after hearing those specs 
Well, actually, the the change in the looks of it, I think, is kind of a shame. It kind of it, it looks a little boring um, mm -hmm. compared to the the one you have, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think all those things are like the built-in Wi-Fi. I mean, that's going to be in every camera coming mm -hmm. out now. Mm -hmm. So um, everything else, well, I can't really compare because I don't know what the other one is like. But yeah. um, I could use the the freeze proof. Uh, living in Minnesota, where we have 14 degrees or below, you're never for there. Six you're always in year. Paris. And when was the last <laughs> time it froze in Paris? <laughs> well, no, but it, it gets cold here, so that is actually kind of kind of a good thing. Um, yeah. I don't know either about the de dedicated HDR button. I don't get too excited about that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but hey, we I think we need to embrace the new technology, and uh, whether we're going to use all of it or not. It's there and it's available and whatever. Yeah, no question know. that this is an this is an upgrade. But like you said, I, I don't know, and I haven't held it, so maybe I'll fall in love with it if if I hold it. But industrial design wise, I I would have rather that they stuck with the OMD mm -hmm. look, that classic kind of look. You know, you know, and you with your Fuji, of course, you're in love with that look now. Yeah. So I don't know, Ron Brinkman. What do you, what do you think? Is this is this incremental or revolutionary, or is it if you're if like me, if I have the OMD already, should I just be like, yeah, whatever? Probably yeah, whatever. I, I don't know. I think it's a nice upgrade. Uh, I have not bought into one of the smaller camera systems yet, so I'm still I'm definitely looking at this as potential option. Uh, it actually bumps me out because it's a little bit larger than than what you've got there. Yeah. And, you know, part of the reason to buy into the Micro Four Thirds is because you want it to be small and, and portable. Um, you know, uh, allegedly the focus speed is dramatically improved, and uh, that's certainly worth something. Um, you know, image quality, I haven't really, I don't think there's really tests out there that people have gotten to yet since it was just released. So, I don't know. You know, I'm, I am still in, and have been for over a year sitting on the fence between which one of these smaller... <laughs> mirrorless camera systems I should be looking into so but it does look know. big and I mean it has that huge grip which actually looks yeah. really comfortable um, mm -hmm. er ergonomically it looks really nice uh, but yeah it looks really big and it has a touch screen so that has to be pretty big too right yep. well no yep. this this the one I have the, the OMD is has a has a touch screen as well the current okay. OMD has a touch screen as well and it's uh it's just you know it's just a regular size so, no yeah. that is yeah, but this that is, is large yeah, it's noticeably larger. I'm just looking at some shots compared to yours, and that I mean that especially the the hand grip is is a lot bigger, but everything is just a little bit bigger. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, the the the, the Micro Four Thirds system is you know, buy into it both because of the nice little cameras and the wide variety of really good lenses that are there, and uh, so I think it's still a pretty strong contender. So you said, Ron, you said you're you're kind of looking. For your yeah. for a smaller camera, would this be a contender of it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I've sort of, you know, it was. I swear, every time I'm ready to take a big trip, I, I'm like, ah, oh, I've got to buy a new camera, so I'm going to buy into one of these things, and then I get crazed doing stuff, getting ready for the trip. And I mean, the trip to 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 Asia and Borneo and everything came about kind of quickly, and so I didn't manage to buy anything before that. So now I'll probably wait until I've got another trip coming up, and then be in that oh crap moment of. I need to buy something and then not get around to doing it. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of waiting to see what Sony comes out with as a next generation high end as well because, you know, it's a really it's a big sensor, uh, but it just, it doesn't have the lens selection that the Micro Four Thirds have. So they go back and forth on that a lot. You mean on the on in the Sony NEX series? Yeah. Yeah, the NEX stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the you know yeah. it's like there's there's these trade offs, right? I mean, there's trade offs in everything. It uh -huh. depends on what you what you need it for. Now, in the last show, I mentioned I, I have a Sony NEX 5R, which is a consumer level camera, but it's still mm -hmm. it's a consumer level ca level camera with an APS-C size sensor in it. So it does some insanely cool photos in this tiny little impossible package. So I love right. that. But again, then again, you know, I am in the the Micro Four Thirds world with this guy with OMD. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, and I have a bunch of lenses for this already. So it's not like you know, it's it's definitely an investment. The choice that you make, but the choice, I don't think it's like you could make a bad choice at this point, especially if you're considering Panasonic, Olympus, or Sony, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I yeah. Think, I think what you should uh, do, Ron, is rent. 
right? <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. It's probably a, a really good way to go. But, you know, you want to have a little selection of lenses to take around with you, too, so... Yeah, I don't know. I, I need to find some some local shooters that'll just let me borrow it for a while. Valerie's smiling over there. <laughs> Valerie's thinking, you know what? Just get a Fuji X100S. <laughs> don't worry about any lenses. Take that thing with you. Do the whole exercise in restriction and beyond. Be gone. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know well, what know. Uh, Doug was saying in his review uh, that. Yeah, I I don't the Fuji is not for you know a camera you'd hand to um, a beginner photographer, right. uh, probably because of the limitations. I mean, it makes you think harder. It makes you work right. harder. And uh, and but ha I really I I, I like that. Um, and that's why I wanted that camera because I didn't have the option of changing lenses. Now I, I'm I'm anxious to try a system with you know a smaller system with with inter interchangeable lenses as well. I, I've never had one, so for me it was going from you know my my 5D Mark II and all the the great glass to uh, a, a fixed line, lens uh, on the Fuji. So because I wanted something different, I already have. A, a, a lens system, but having a, a nice lens system on a smaller camera um, that that would be that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, in in yeah. in that vein, one of the other cameras that that came out recently, um, I'm not sure if it's shipping yet. If it's not, it should be shortly, and that's the the Panasonic Lumix GX7. Have you guys have you seen that one yet? Nope. Uh, it kind of came across my radar, and I I don't know. I remember looking at it and thinking, yeah, there's nothing that's really Jumping out at me is a must-have out of that. But look at that! I'm, I'm showing it on the screen right now for those that are listening to this. This thing has mm -hmm. that. Uh, I would think that this is going up against at least styling-wise the Fuji X100s because it mm -hmm. has that whole that retro styling. But it is a micro Four Thirds camera with a with an electronic yep. viewfinder and in-body image stabilization. And all that goodness. It even has Wi-Fi and NFC connectivity, so you can just tap your smartphone to it and have it connect. You know that kind of stuff. Yep. So, I don't know, Valerie. This you know, <laughs> this might be cool. the happy medium between yeah. having a micro four, a straight micro four third system like the OMD, and getting the retro, newfangled power of you know. I don't know. Yeah. It's too many choices. And and I think that's what manufacturers have to do now. I mean. <laughs> Eventually, all the cameras are going to be offering the same thing. So now it's right. going to be a matter of the, the look of it that's going to be a determining factor. Um, I'm not being on brand. I don't care. You know, I can yeah. go from Canon to Nikon to Fuji to Olympus. Amen. Uh, it, whatever, <laughs> whatever fits the the job, and whatever I feel comfortable with. I really See, that's don't a real care photographer. That is that is what I've been preaching. A real photographer. When I was I was running around playing with my my NEX with the Sony NEX, and I took pictures with it, posted online. Of course, the trolls come out, and there are, everyone's <laughs> got to say. You know, oh, Frederick, you're abandoning Olympus. Uh, you're abandoning <laughs> Nightbook. Now you're in the Sony camp and all this stuff. I'm like, why do, ha why do there have to be camps? Where are these <laughs> camps? <laughs> I, know. I know. And where do the checks come from? You know, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ron, do you see that? Do like, people you know, in your uh, circle, I mean, do people are like, you know, very brand centric? Yeah, but you know what? As. My experience is that the, the more sophisticated, uh, experienced shooters start to really migrate away from that brand loyalty kind of thing and are just like, yeah, you know, this is what I bought. I've got a lot of money in it, so there's a practical decision. I may stay with it. But, you know, I, I think, and especially with, you know, when it was just Canon and Nikon, you kind of had to stick with it because you had all the the gear and everything that goes with it. But I think there's so many people like you and like I will be and everybody that are sort of saying, okay, I'm going to, go into a completely different direction with this Micro Four Thirds or the mirrorless or whatever. And uh, and at that point, you can just kind of say, I don't have to stick with one brand, and I, I have a new choice here. So Yeah, yeah, and that was weird. I'll tell you, one of the, the weirdest things that... And I'm still on this whole mirrorless journey, you know, trying to figure out what what it, it all means. Um, sounds like a Zen journey or something. I'm walking <laughs> barefoot like Ron Brinkman. Around. <laughs> but you know, it kind of feels like when I first got this camera, I was like, okay, um, this is awesome. And then I bought a Panasonic. Like the lens that's on here right now is a Lumix. It's a Panasonic 14 millimeter lens that I have on this Olympus body. And yeah. that was like, 
you know, that's heresy. Yeah, <laughs> I love like, that. I love that. It's not an Olympus lens on this, ca- and it still focuses perfectly, and everything works great. You know, that's impossible. So that'd be like running, you know, Windows software without emulation on a Mac or something. So. I don't know. So, yeah, I, I wish everything was like that. I wish we would get to the point where it just didn't matter, and everyone's like Valerie, and it's just about the art. You just yeah. go out there, who cares? You know, as a matter of fact, if you guys look at this, if you're, if you're listening to this, I'm holding up my, my OMD here, and if you look uh-huh. at the front of my OMD... Can't see the brand. There's no brand on here. That's right. Yeah. Everything's blocked off on purpose with black <laughs> tape. So if someone comes up to me and they say... Hey, what are you shooting with? I immediately already know to categorize them in that gearhead category. Right. <laughs> it's called now, a what camera. Are you shooting? What, what are you doing? You know, it's like, what are you shooting with is the most important thing. Yep. Yep. It's a camera. I don't know. I'm just getting, I'm, I'm turning into old man. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in my day, we shot with uh, Nikon F3s and manual, and we liked yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's jump into story number two here, um, which is the big news of this week that we're in right now, and that's Apple. Apple announced or unveiled the newest iteration to the iPhone line. So they unveiled the iPhone 5S, the new flagship model, and the 5C, a more affordable plastic offering that starts at 100 I think it's 100 bucks, probably under contract, but it starts at 99 bucks. Um, and this new line is five colors, which is what the C stands for. So the specs for the 5S, the top of the line one, is what we want to talk about here. Is So essentially the 5C is the iPhone 5 with a plastic back that you can get in color. So that's that's the gist of it. The 5S is the new flagship top of the line version. It's got their new A7 chip in it. It's the first 64-bit processor for smartphones. It's got a cool touch ID fingerprint sensor so you don't have to do your little punch in your key, your code to unlock the phone. You just touch your, fo- your finger to it and it unlocks. It's got LTE wireless. It's got a 15% larger sensor um, in the camera to reduce noise. It's at 120 frame per second video so you can do uh, slow motion and 720 FPS. Live video zoom and pinch to zoom up to 3x. Burst shooting in the camera up to 10 frames per second. Just hold down the shutter button, shutter button, and it'll just rattle them off. Um, autofocus matrix, matrix metering, auto exposure adjustment in panorama mode, so you don't get the, those dips between one end of the panorama to the other. It's got this new thing called True Tone Flash, where I don't know if it's new, but it's it's you know, they're branded it Two Tone Flash, where they're actually adding. You have a main light and then a colored fill light to add more skin tone color into the photos. Um, the camera is still 8 megapixel like the iPhone 5, but the sensor is larger, and Apple is saying it provides up to 33% increase in light sensitivity. It's got eight filters built into it, so you could do Instagram-like filters either while you shoot, so you could see the filters applied live, or um, you can apply them after, like you can do in Instagram. And they've got optical image stabilization, so to remove that camera shake, but only it's only digital. It's not. It's it says only digital in the notes, but I, I have to play with it to see exactly how it compares to what Instagram yeah, does I, I, I in think software. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just. I think it's just the software. It's just software. software yeah, it's just running on it. Yeah. And yeah. what's what's the last thing here yeah. is it's a, it's available in black, silver, and. Gold. <laughs> so, oh, I'm not a fan gold. of the gold. I don't know why that gold bugs me. <laughs> it feels Maybe like gold it's is coming back. Cast you it or something. I don't know. Yeah, well, and apparently it, it is coming back. It, it's actually a nice shade of gold. It's a champagne kind of color they're calling it. So. And it, and it yeah. still make phone. You can still make phone calls with it, right? You forgot to mention that. It still makes calls, and I okay, believe, uh, yeah, text messaging <laughs> is also included. Okay, good, good. Okay, I was worried there for a second. So, Ron, I want, to, I want to put this on you first. You're ex-Apple. We're both ex-Apple. Um, I'm always yep. interested to hear what you think about these releases, and if were, were you like, ho-hum, you know, that's great, or this is a ground-breaking release, and I'm going to go order it right now. What did you think? Well, my number one concern whenever uh, Apple releases something new is what does it do to the stock price? Uh, <laughs> of course. And from that perspective, this is a really, really bad release for us. <laughs> this is affecting your trip to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not a good day on, on Wall Street. Um, but disregarding that, yes. hopefully it comes back up. 
uh, yeah, nothing to well, I mean, no surprises, right? I think it's everything that we expected. Actually, I, the fact that it has a larger sensor behind the lens was something that I hadn't heard leaked in the uh, in the press, and, and you know that that's a significant thing. I mean, fifteen percent isn't huge, but between that and and uh, a slightly faster lens on there. Uh, you know, the hope is that low light capability and noise levels and all that sort of stuff will be improved. And so I find that interesting. You know, I'm I'm coming, I still have the uh, 4S, so yeah, I will I. probably upgrade yeah. to this. Um, you know, it's time for me to upgrade. You know, my two-year thing is coming up, so I'll probably do that. You know, I, I personally, I was hoping for a larger uh, a larger phone, and, you know, I, I'm in that same camp where it's like, God, should I just jump over to Android? But... I don't know, I'm just kind of wired in. Uh, plus, you know, I'm doing iPhone development these days, so... Uh, you could have yeah, both. So kinda, you could have both. I, I could have both, that's true. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, the speed of, of, of the video, the, the fact that it can actually shoot at 120 frames a second so you can get some really nice slow-mo out of it for video, um, I think there's a lot there for, for from the camera point of view, at least. Yeah, I'm uh, excited I mean, to play for me, with it. You know, I'll tell you, Ryan, you, you hit on two things for me. So, as I said in, in previous shows, I'm currently playing with this guy. So, I have a 4S as well, iPhone 4S, which is my daily driver, my main my main phone. Um, but I have this guy, and this is the uh, this is the Moto X. And uh -huh. the screen, like you, you mentioned screen size. So, here's a screen next to the 4S. Um, right. Let's see if you can see the size there. So it's it's markedly big. It's not that much bigger that you know you have to use two hands to go around it, and it's not one of those giant, you know, Moses tablet phones that they're coming out with. Tablet, yes. Yeah, I the saw tablets, somebody today. You know? I, I saw someone today walking around the lake with. I mean, you you can only hold, hand hold those phones. You can't really attach them to yeah. your belt or anything. With this, it looked like an iPad Mini. Yeah, it's like and you it hold that phone. thing up to your head to talk on it. It's like you're calling in an airstrike <laughs> in, or something. It's, I thought things were getting smaller. Why are phones getting bigger? They're not. That's, they're I don't not, get not it. Not for me. Not for me. I mean, I want. I wanted something. I was really hoping for something a little bit bigger than the 4s or the 5, but not phablet. And that's yeah, that's right, this yeah. Moto X. That's the size. But thing like Ron, you said that that entails moving camps, and we being Apple people. Like, I'm sure you have at least one Apple TV in your house. You wouldn't be controlling yep. that with your phone, you know, none of that stuff. And then the other thing about the Moto X that I'm lamenting right now, which is widely reported, is the camera in this thing is can't hold a candle to even the 4S camera, right? So I don't right. know if it's, it's a software update that Motorola needs to make or something, but it needs to happen in order for this to be even be considered a photographer's walk-around daily driver. Right. So. We'll see. I don't know. So other but, you know, other than that stuff, Ron, what do you think? No, well, you know the interesting thing is it's you know the camera is definitely better. It's it's no longer you know as of uh, when the Nokia Lumia came out, it's no longer the best camera out there on a phone, and uh, you know and even with this new update, it's no longer that. So uh, you know I think there was a there was a period of time where the best camera was on an Apple phone, and that's no longer the case. Yeah. Um, but. You know, I, like I said, I'll I'll probably end up getting it, and I think honestly, I suspect that the speed, you know, the 10 frames per second burst mode, and some of the stuff that people will probably be able to do in software with some of this stuff, you know, really good slow mo. I mean, you take that, you can shoot at 120 frames per second, and then add in some good optical flow, you can get some crazy good slow motion stuff. Yeah. You know, a combination of of hardware and software. Um, 10 frames per second. Buffering is where you can do that ultra fast shooting gives you a lot of things that you can do, you know. And we're going to be looking into some of this uh, on the software side of things. Guys, some cool ideas I have for you know what can you do with, you know, really high quality, high resolution images that are also taken a, you know, a tenth of a second apart. Uh, there's a lot there. There's so, a lot, yeah, there's a lot to play with. There's yeah. a lot more data coming in that you can you can run through your software, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and then one other little sort of interesting thing that goes with it is the. Um, the CPU in there supposedly has some kind of data logging that can run without an app uh, running behind it. It's like built into the CPU. So things like the motion sensor, you know, is this is this moving around kind of thing. For stuff like, you know, like your Fitbit or whatever, where normally you'd wear a dedicated device that checks how much you're moving during the day, that's now going to be feasible with this phone without, you know, being a total battery hog. So, cool. yeah, you know, it... Not a huge release, but it's not a bad one, I don't think. 
Yeah, Valerie, what, what do you what do you think about um, this? Are you like specifically from the standpoint of is this the phone that you're going to purchase? And on the camera side of it, two part question on the cam on the camera side of this, is is this just the the final nail in the coffin of the point and shoot camera at least in the United States? What do you think? Um, well, I I have the 4S also, and I'm compl I mean it does everything I need. I need, so I'm not upgrading until it dies. Uh, I don't really jump on new stuff right away because I just don't see a huge improvement. Um, for the phone, um, I, I don't think anyone buys an iPhone, I mean for the camera, I don't think anybody buys an iPhone for the camera, at least yeah. anymore. Um, as uh, Ron was saying, uh, Nokia Lumia, is that how you call it? Lumia, uh, mm -hmm. And even Samsung, I think now their phones have better uh, have better cameras. Um, I know for sure the Nokia. I mean, it looks pretty impressive. So I think you mean we Microsoft, get... right? Uh, yeah, is that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> is it Nokia Soft now or Micro <laughs> Micro Ia? Well, that's right. I don't know. Um, I think we get iPhones because we're familiar with the. I mean, we all had iPod, iPod Touch. So you get an iPhone, and you there is no learning curve. We know how to use it, and that's yeah. why we we stay in the Apple world because it's familiar. Um, and yeah, I don't I don't know if the point and shoot has any a, any chance of uh, of making it if everybody has a a phone with eight megapixel or more in their pocket. Yeah. No, when you when you're out and about on your workshops, you know it used to be. At least for me, it used to be when you when you left the house and you knew you were going to take photos, you had your phone, which took crappy photos back in the day, so you didn't rely on that. But you might take a point and shoot, right? If you yeah. knew that, okay, I'm going to some thing where I might want to take a good shot, I'm going to take my point and shoot. And you might also have your DSLR if you're like Valerie and you're on a workshop. Now, how has that picture changed? Are you the mirrorless and iPhone person and the DSLR is break glass in case of emergency or does that st guy still come with you? No, the DSLR is not uh, It's not going to accrue any uh, freaking fly miles anytime soon, I don't think. Um, I <laughs> Poor DSLR. <laughs> I, I mean, I use it for client shoots, uh, for commercial shoots still, but that's it. And I don't even think I'll bring it on my next workshop. Um, wow. I uh, I really like my uh, my mirrorless. No, Ron, it's comfortable. What, how does that make awesome. you feel, Ron? This is therapy session for Ron. I, I think it's feel? awesome. <laughs> I do because I I've been I've been annoyed with the size of the crap I've been carrying around for so many vacations, and just to keep hearing that it's very viable to not have to have that big of a bag full of stuff. Yeah, because when I travel, I like to travel light. You know, I, I don't pack a lot of other stuff. But then you get that thing of, all right, three quarters of the weight of what I'm carrying around is camera gear. Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of having it be, be reduced in size. And the fact that the quality is acceptable to all of these experienced shooters fills me with great joy. Yeah, great joy. Yeah, it, but so like you were saying, the problem becomes there are so many cool choices out there, and more showing up. It seems uh -huh. like every month or so. How do you choose? I got a, I got a, I think it was a Google Plus message or something from someone today saying, Sony, Panasonic, or Olympus. Which should I choose? So if someone came to you, Ron, and said, yeah. okay, I have all these choices. I'm ready to to make the leap away from the DSLR mirrored world into mirrorless. What would you tell them to do? Uh, well, uh, that's exactly the position I'm in, so I guess I'd tell them to wait. <laughs> so in other words, what are you going to do, Ron Brinkman? <laughs> I know. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I am going to wait a little while longer. Uh, I believe that Sony is about due for a higher, you know, sort of the replacement of their high-end NEX system. So we'll see what that brings, and then I'll probably make the decision, and if it's nothing radical, uh, and take another look at the lens Availability for the Sony system. Otherwise, I would probably go with the uh, probably that that OMD. Very cool. You know, what's your, what's yeah, your price range going to be? Under under two thousand, under three thousand. Uh, you know, it's going to be whatever, replacing whatever my main she system. lets you spend, right? Whatever she lets. Yeah, you. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you have left. The new boss the will determine that. Yeah, <laughs> your new exactly. That's your new over. CFO. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Whatever exactly. you can save Whatever up I've the got... wedding photographer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like whatever's, left whatever's left over, left I can over. buy a camera with. <laughs> can I can I make one more one more comment on wedding photography? Yeah, <laughs> please <Sure>. do. <laughs> I am, 
I've you know I've have t- talked to several of them at this point and uh, I've asked them, can I get all of the photos you shoot in raw format? And there is a <laughs> oh no, you didn't. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> and I understand why people don't want to do that, but. Come on, just give me everything and let me deal with it myself. <laughs> Rod, you turned into that guy. Look at that. <laughs> come on, Frederick, come on. If, if somebody was shooting your wedding, would yeah. you not want to have the raw files from what they're shooting? Oh, I'd have everything, yeah. With them. <laughs> okay. No, anyway. I'd have Sarah France come and do it, and I wouldn't have to worry about a thing. There you go. Uh, there you go. Call Sarah to do it. She's down there somewhere. Yeah. Fly her out. You know, sneak her in as a guest oh, yeah. and just let her shoot yeah, it mirrorless. They won't think she's a real wedding. photographer. <laughs> yep, that's true. That's true. There you go. Like, yeah. why is this person with this little camera all over the place? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Done. That's true. There you go. Oh, yep. Cool, man. I don't. Um, I'm yeah. just, no, go ahead. I'm like, come on, just give me the raw files. Just give me the raw files, please. All right, Twip listeners, contact ask? Ron Brinkman if if you could if you're if you where are you going? Kauai, did you say? Kauai, yes. Yeah, if you're a Kauai yes. on the approved list for some resorts out there, contact Ron Brinkman and agree to give him the raw files from the shoot, <laughs> and you, we'll mention yep. you on Twip. How about that? <laughs> That's true. That is there true. You know, we'll talk about it. We'll give you some exposure to our leads and some <laughs> listeners. Yeah, we'll get we'll yep. give a photographer exposure to other photographers. Like that's going to drum up more business. <laughs> right. <laughs> true. Yeah. It's wrong yeah. audience. Because we have I an audience full of Alex, brides. I right. should talk to Alex about maybe borrowing a bunch of his red cameras for the video shoot, though. There you go. There <laughs> you go. I think he has one yeah. or two laying around that he probably could let you borrow. I think he just shot his brother's wedding with a red camera. So. Jeez. I can't believe Joe got married. Know. That's a whole nother story. Joe's a kid getting married. <laughs> Children getting married. What's going on? The world, dogs and cats raining down. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's get to the last story here. The last one is Sigma. Sigma has announced a camera mount conversion service. So basically, I'm going to read this. It says, looking to switch your camera loyalties but worried about being tied to one system because of your investment in lenses, you may consider... Sigma lenses as they just introduced a new mount conversion service that will allow you to send in your existing Sigma lenses and have the mount converted to work with another system. Do you guys care about this? Like, you know, I <laughs> Valerie, I know you're like, I don't even switch lenses anymore. What do I need? <laughs> what do I need this for? I, I, I have owned actually a Sigma lens. I probably still have it somewhere. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That seems like a lot of work, so you have to send them in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, but yeah. hey, yeah. yeah, jumping through a, hot, a lot of hoops to to get that done. Yeah, it, it's it's one is a small value add when you're considering what lens to get. I mean, there, there's a yeah. uh, in particular, there's one new Sigma lens. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's a fairly wide one that is uh, getting a whole lot of accolades for being, you know, sort of like the widest high quality uh, short zoom that's out there. So you know, very good lens and. Maybe this extra little ability to do some swapping between systems, if you think that's in your future, would be enough to tip you over into buying it. So, and they're it, they're it quite a bit sense. cheaper, aren't they? I mean, Sigma is Sigma is is usually cheaper, but I think that you know some of these premium ones that they're doing yeah. now are in the same ballpark. They're in the same ballpark, yeah. Sigma and Tamron, they have those high-end lenses, which are yeah, oh. yeah comparable to the uh, the regular OEM lenses. So the the question, Valerie, I want to put this on you. So you are you're moving squarely in the direction of high tech and mirrorless and all that stuff. Has it crossed your mind? Like it used to cross my mind all the time. Like, man, what's the next lens I'm gonna buy? Man, I really want that 14 to 24. You know, that used to be in my head all the time. Not so much lately. And when it does come in my head, it's like, man, I need a I need a long lens for my Micro Four Thirds camera. <laughs> how do I how do I solve that nut? Are you are you in the same camp? Have you forsaken the DSLR, your lens buying habits? Um, well, I know I own my last DSLR for sure. Uh, I'll never buy another one. Hmm. Um, wow. And I'm actually considering selling. Wow. <gasps> I said it. Yeah. You said it. <laughs> Here, live Thanks. on Twip. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I'm not going to get rid of the of the body and a couple of the, the lenses. I mean, I have, you know... Uh, my um, how do you call them? Um, my bread and butter lens. Is that how yeah. you say it in, in English? Okay. It, yes. um, but bread, like, or, or butter and croissant or whatever. <laughs> the other day, <laughs> I, I was uh, putting my 
I, I, I was going on a photo walk. Um, I have a small photo walk group here. Um, and I thought, oh, I'm going to take the Canon and I'm going to put the 70 to 200 2.8 mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And then I took it out and I ran back in and I grabbed the Fuji. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I just could not do it. I'm like, it was like 100 degrees out. So what am I going to do carrying this, you know, 10-pound lens with? Yeah. When I can have my tiny little Fuji with my fixed lens, I don't have to carry a bag, and I'm happy. That's interesting. Now, did, did you find on that particular outing that you were missing? And I know what the answer is to this already because you've said it. When you go on workshops, you don't really miss the DSLR except in really extreme circumstances, but on that particular one, when you went back in to get the Fuji, did you find yourself saying, well, yeah, I have this fixed focal length of, what is it, 28 millimeter? Uh, yes, tw it's an equivalent to 35. It's yeah, 35 millimeter, but, you know, had I brought out the, the Iron Man suit, I could have got some, <laughs> some really cool shots. No, I mean, this was a casual photo walk. It wasn't, I wasn't teaching, it was just hanging out with friends. I don't think that way. I don't ever think, oh, I wish I had. I mean, even in Iceland, it barely crossed my mind that, yeah, I could have had my my Canon and with all my lenses. No, I had the Fuji with the 35 millimeter lens, and that's yeah. all I had. And I, you know, I said, well, that's not going to prevent me from making some good pictures. And and um, I I wasn't carrying a crappy camera phone. I had a pretty nice piece of equipment. Yes, it's limiting. But I don't go out there and wish I had something else. I, yeah. That's just not me. I just go and make the best of it. And um, I, that's uh, so. But, no, you know, I, didn't playing, miss, I didn't miss playing devil's advocate, especially with Ron on the show, who's he represents the the segment of the listeners that are on the fence between, you know, either moving to mirrorless or adding mirrorless to their arsenal. One of the, like Valerie, the, your style of shooting is street photography, a lot of it, right? So you're mm -hmm. out and about and you know, things catch your eye, you grab it, you do, you know, you put your photography skills into effect and you make some art on the spot, but you're not sure what you're going to get. What about for those photographers that preconceptualize what they're going to do? Like, they know, I'm going to San Francisco, I'm going to shoot a long exposure of the base of the Bay Bridge with some rocks in the foreground and blur the water and all that stuff, and I need the flexibility to be able to do that and oh. not limit myself. Is this Oh, absolutely. No, I mean then for sure, but I don't see why they they would have to have the the DSLR system. I mean, I'm yeah. sure they can take that new Olympus with a variety of lenses, or the older, Olympus, or the older one <laughs> yeah. with with a few lenses and get the same image, same images. It's all about perception at that point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure good. that the, the the quality of the image is not going to make a difference, except. You know, for some cases, like I don't shoot fast action sports, but um, I hear that um, that's, that would still be limiting with uh, a smaller yes. system. But uh, but that's only for now. I'm sure that's going to change eventually too. Um, and, and and I really do think that DSLRs. I mean, slowly you're you're going to start seeing wedding photographers with smaller systems, and and people will get used to it. I think at this point it would be really tough to go out and shoot for a client with a smaller systems, but people are starting to do that and I think the more more people who are um, I mean who deliver quality work are going to deliver quality work no matter what they shoot with and at that point the perception of oh you have a big camera you must make better pictures, I think that's on its way out, and hopefully that's, you know, well, let, no, let's nobody's going to think let's, that. Let's test that theory <laughs> right now, because we, okay. we have a unique opportunity to test that theory. We've got a groom-to-be on the show who's looking for a wedding photographer <laughs> with the, and has the budget to pay for it to do it right, right? So, Ron, if you hired one of those staff photographers from the resort that you're getting married at, and that photographer mm -hmm. showed up, let's say, with this Olympus OMD, or maybe two of them, and one as mm -hmm. a backup, you know. How would you feel about that? Yeah, that's a good pause. question. Um, but, 
But you'd look at their work well, first. I, I, I mean, think, you'd see their portfolio. Yeah, obviously. Obviously, you so, look at their portfolio. You know, the only thing that concerned me, because, you know, most of the wedding stuff is going to be, there's going to be, it's during the day, there's a reasonable amount of lighting. I, you know, I guess the only thing that would concern me is you, you're not going to get that super creamy, uh, bokeh, you know, tiny, tiny depth of field kind of stuff yeah. with a slightly smaller sensor camera. But... Uh, you know, if you got a longer lens, you pop onto it, then you can still kind of do the same thing. So, so would you? So, so you were interviewing. You're interviewing the photographer, and you're sitting in the room. The photographer shows up, and you're like, "So, John or Jane, what what do you shoot with? You know, I'm on this week in photo, and I know my way around mm -hmm. photography. Tell me, what what kind of gear are you going to use to shoot my once in a lifetime?" event, hopefully, right? <laughs> so, and they say, well, I shoot with a Fuji X100S and I'm an artist. You know, what, what would you say? Um, with a fixed lens? With a fixed lens. <laughs> <laughs> I have to send you a link, yeah, actually. I Remember Frederick, this guy wait, from wait. the from England who sent um, who does wedding photography with the yeah. X100S black yeah. and white. It's amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. But the, what my line of questioning is getting at? No, I'm not. I'm not yeah. questioning the capability yeah. of the camera. I'm questioning the perception of the capability, yeah. especially with someone with a once in a lifetime event coming up. Are you? Are we as a society of people ready to embrace the technology? Or would you do you need the placebo of that giant DSLR at your wedding to uh, make you feel better that you're going to get a shot? No, it's not that. I, I, I think you know. Yeah, I mean, I would ask the hard questions. I would need to see the portfolio. I'd need to understand why they've made the decision to choose. Because it, you know, some of the reasons why you have a micro four thirds system is for things like portability and all that. And that's not. That wouldn't be a reason that you would necessarily need at a wedding, right? You're you're in one location, you can have a big gear bag, you can do all that kind of stuff. So I don't right. necessarily see, you know, other than just personal preference, why would you have a micro four thirds system at a wedding? Um, you know, a lot of the advantages aren't really there for wedding photography, I guess. Have you have so, you shot a I, wedding lately? Have you have you humped around with DSLR no, I, times no. two on and, your back for eight hours? <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. You know, although you know yes. usually you're usually you're you're Paying for a photographer and an assistant at least, so. Right, right. But yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, yeah. You know, if there if there's good reasons why, I would I would not be against it, uh, assuming their portfolio looked good. Well, we're gonna check in with you. I want to find out once once you're an official husband. I want to find out what that yep. photographer shot your wedding with, <laughs> and I want to see some right. photos uh, of how they look. Yep. Cool. I would definitely right, do that. So let's, uh, let's, let's move on. Before we continue with the listener Q&A segment, I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that's our friends over at Squarespace.com. Okay, it's time for our listener Q&A. This is a segment where we answer questions that have been at the top of some of our listeners' minds. The first question is from Dave. Actually, the only question that we're going to get to today is from Dave. He says... When you're first starting out in photography and you're planning to make it a business, how can you choose a name that's unique and will grab attention from all customers? I feel if I were to use my name, I would get less attention because my last name is very hard to pronounce and my first name is so common. So this is a, a kind of a business question. What do you name your business? In, and I want to put it to, to you guys. Valerie, I want you to hopefully take this one. My, my thing is when I see lists of photographer names, it's always... First name, last name, photography, or photography by first name, last name, or photography by last name. Nothing, and maybe every now and then there's something creative in there, like, you know, flying unicorn photography or something, but it's always something like that. What, what do you think about this? How should Dave name his business, Valerie? Well, especially if he's starting out, he has to be very careful not to get stuck in a in a niche market, you know, he can't have a, a a name for his for his photography that has to that will uh, convey the idea of family portraiture and weddings, for example. And then he decides he's going to shoot products. Yeah. So, so that's why I think a lot of photographers use their name as their brand because they may go in different directions. Um, I when I read the question, I I thought. Uh, you know the guy you interviewed who does the pet photography mm -hmm. uh, yeah, recently? Yeah, the, the photographer, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think the name I, I wrote it down it was the sh Shaggy Shutter Bug. Okay. Yes, yeah, the Shaggy Shutter Bug. It's it's a catchy name. It's it's very clever, and I think it's a it it's it's perfect for his for his business. Yes. That said, he can't start shooting weddings with that name. Yeah, it depends on the wedding, but yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you really have to, before you pick a name that is uh, specific to a genre of photography, you have to make sure you're going to stick with that and you're not going to expand your business to something else. And that's why I think having something more generic but still original uh, besides your name, it's hard. Everything's taken. Yeah, so something like, <laughs> something that's like uh, Twilight photography or... You know, Boca, beautiful Boca <laughs> photography, something like that that's generic that can apply to anything is what you're saying, right? You'd, you'd have to, I think, especially when you're starting out because he, he unless he decides he wants to shoot weddings and that's all he's ever going to do, yeah. uh, you can't be too specific. Yeah. My, my two well, the other thing, uh, the other piece yeah. of that business-wise, at least here in the U.S., is the the when you file for a business license, it's easier to, if you use your name in your business because you know, you're just doing a DBA and it's it's based on your name. You don't have to do a copyright search and all that other crazy stuff That's because true. it's your name. You know, you're legally allowed to, allowed to use your name as a business name, so it makes it the path of least resistance for a lot of people. I don't know, Ron. Ron Brinkman, what do, what would you say to this? Parting thoughts on uh, on business naming. Yeah, I don't. I mean, just I was just looking at the list of approved vendors uh, that I could choose from, and you know, there's uh, <laughs> probably three quarters of them are people's names, but there's you know Pacific Dream and Sea Light Studios mm -hmm. and uh, Kilahano Photo and uh, Fish Eye Studio. So there's there's still um, you know several named you know not not personal names kind of things. I, you know, but my advice is. So what if your name is long and hard to pronounce? It also makes it distinctive, right? It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's far better to have something that is memorable than John Smith photography, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I unless it's just so unmanageable that you just don't want to deal with it. I, I don't see anything wrong with naming it just your name. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, 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 you're, and, you're, and you're always building a brand. You know, you're always building a brand at that point. So, mm -hmm. you know, you you could go the other way, but you know, if you go, if you if you start out using your name and people get to know it, and then you decide you want to have a company that is a broader sort of thing that isn't just your name, you can go that direction. But if you start off with a company name and then go decide you want to have your own personal name there instead, I don't think it's as easy a move. Yeah. Well, and then with that moving piece, the other part of it is if you one day you decide you want to sell the business, you know. So if you if you created True. flying unicorn photography. It's easier to give that to someone and and take a check in return than it is to give Ron Brinkman photography to someone and deal with all that mess that goes yeah. with the transfer. That is true, but generally, if you're building a business around yourself as a creative, then you're not going to be able to sell it anyway. You know, not not in that same way. Not you know, it's not right. like a software company or something. Right. Right. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. So yeah, good good feedback. So. Uh, listener Dave, I would love it if you stay in contact with us and let us know if that was helpful and what you end up naming your business. I'm curious to see what you go with. All right, guys, let's jump into the picks of the week. This is the segment where you guys can pick anything to re recommend to the TWIP army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Valerie, I'm going to allow you to go first. What is your um, pick of the week? Well, something a little different. Um, I mean, I, I love Kelby Training and Lynda.com. I know there are a lot of other tutorials, some that are free that are really good, but when you go with either one of, of those two, you know you're going to get quality. And a lot of people think you have to do the yearly membership. And uh, I often tell my um, my uh, workshop students if they have like a month where they know they're going to have some time or if they want to give up their favorite uh, TV show every day for an hour and, and spend that hour on either one of those two and, and learn how to use, for example, Lightroom in depth or, or get some inspiration. They can just spend 25 bucks for a month and they can get so much content for $25. So it's just uh, something I thought about suggesting because uh, it's a very small investment for a lot of quality uh, learning. It is, and I, I'd echo that too because there's, there's just a ton of stuff on both Linda and Kelby, and they approach, they approach online training in two different ways. Like I would, 
I don't know. I mean, I would categorize Linda as almost like the library of Congress of everything yeah. that you want to know about any piece of software out there, you know. And then Kelby is more creative focused and photography and Adobe software and, you know, that kind of stuff. So for our audience... You could learn Lightroom on either place mm -hmm. um, or go to Kelby and get Lightroom and Photoshop and all that stuff. So it just depends on what you want to learn. If you want to learn WordPress and how to set up a website, then lynda.com for sure. If mm -hmm. you want to learn Lightroom 5, then I would probably steer people towards Kelby. So lots of, yeah, lots of good stuff on both. But also, it's not only about learning a software. They have really great, like you can spend an hour with Jay Maisel on Kelby training. And um, same, lynda.com has some wonderful photographers that they've interviewed and followed on photo walks that are just so inspirational. And uh, I really recommend that too. Love it. Love it. Cool. All right. Both lynda.com and Kelby training. Ron Brinkman, what is your pick or picks of the week? Uh, yes, I actually have two. One of them is a little <laughs> self-serving, um, and, and also, all, all, well, whenever I do two, one of them is self-serving, and one of them is uh, for the good of everybody. Yep. The uh, the first one is also for a very specific audience. Uh, my mother, a seventy-something-year-old mother, has written a book on parenting, nice. and. Go ahead and, and make any comments you want to make about how I turned out. <laughs> I was, was going to go there. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, go is, this, is this science fiction or horror? Or is <laughs> no, well, you know, I, there, 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 there may, however, be a few amusing anecdotes about certain of her children inside of the book. Now, she, my, my mom has, uh, has, has been, uh, you know, she's been a pro university professor. She has her PhD in, in child development. She's uh, been working with parents and parenting and teaching about this sort of thing for her entire career. And uh, it's actually, yeah, I, I helped. Uh, proofread it and edit it for her before it went to the publisher, and it, it's um, I was like, wow, there's actually some good stuff in here. It's uh, <laughs> it's very in depth. It's also very um, you know very sensible uh, advice for a new parent uh, up to somebody that's probably got you know uh, middle school aged children or something like that. So it's called a walk through parenting. We'll put a link in the site, uh, or you can just search for Brinkman Parenting. Uh, and you'll get the book, and uh, if you, you do purchase it and like it, she would, of course, love to get good reviews on it as well on Amazon. Um, you know, it's the, the problem that all of us have as creatives in, in creating something is how do you get the word out. So if you know somebody that has uh, children and is looking for a good parenting book, feel free to pass the info on to them as well. Ron, while, um, while you were talking... So that's talking. my first pick. While you were talking, I one-click Amazon Prime purchased that book. It is on its way to my house right now. Wow. Look nice. at that. Nice. Look at that. Very good. And you're not even a parent. I'm helping out. Look at Unless that. I'm looking at you. Good. See? I got, you. I got you back, <laughs> I <love> man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Very good. So my other pick, a real quick one. This is total total fun. Uh, for my birthday, I, I my fiancé got me a Parrot AR drone have you seen this thing? She's a keeper, Ron. I just got to tell you, she, she is definitely a keeper. She's yeah. buying you drone aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that woman. Yep, yep. Well, she bought me a bunch of shirts and stuff, and she's like, all right, I realize that all the shirts are for me, not for you, so I also got you this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, have you seen this this little quadcopter uh, thing from Paris? I it's have. a $300 drone. Uh, and the reason I mention it is because it is actually photography related, because it's got both a uh, front-facing and a down-facing camera. The front-facing camera is HD quality, and so it's a really cheap entree into getting yourself, you know, an aerial drone uh, camera, you know, for doing photography. It's really cool. It's you know controlled by your iPhone. You can actually use turn it on so when you tilt the iPhone, the drone tilts and moves in the direction you're, you're telling it to go based on the tilt. Uh, it can be capturing movies this whole time, so uh, it, it's it's actually a hell of a lot of fun, and you know you get a video out of it when you're done. That is kind of cool. Can so, that thing fly outside, or is it indoor only? Can it compensate for wind and all that? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely outside. I mean, it's incredible how sophisticated these things are. It's, you know, it's sort of self-stabilizing. So when you take your fingers off the control, it just stops in place and hovers. So you know, it's just like, oh crap, it's going somewhere. Hang on, and you just sort of let it stabilize. Uh, when the wind hits it, it tries to, it resists that and tries to go back to where, you know, wherever it was hovering. So it's got uh, GPS. It's really in it, pretty then. smart. It's it's pretty cool. 
I don't think it's GPS. I think what it does is it uses the down-facing camera to do sort of a, a picture of where it thinks it's supposed to be, and then it compensates to try to keep that in place. Wow. Just pretty, pretty darn clever. That's crazy. I'm looking at I'm looking at the page on Amazon, yep. and it says it receives 720p HD live video streaming to your smartphone or tablet while flying. Yep. It records yeah, and shares got, videos and pictures. Little... It, uh, it, where is it? Remote control quadcopter controlled by iPod Touch, iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Crazy. Jeez. 300 bucks yeah. though, Ron. It's $300. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is, but, you know, most of these, your, your next step up on, in the drone world is more, you know, is well over 1,000, so it's actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good deal for, for what it is. Yeah. And, I mean, think about it. You know, this is something that you absolutely could not buy four or five years ago. You know, the technology just didn't exist at all. And now you can get, you can fly an HD, you know, helicopter over your house for $300. That's insane. So, That's insane. But I'll tell you, yeah, I, was, I was able to buy a walkthrough parenting, create your personal parenting plan for thirteen forty five from Amazon, not $300. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. See, so. I've got a nice and expensive pick. <laughs> and a little more. And one, yeah, the geeky pick and the not so geeky pick. So perfect. Yeah, awesome. exactly. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, Ron. My right. my pick of the week is the Drobo Mini. So when Dro the Drobo Mini came out a while back, it was I think they priced this thing at it had to be like seven hundred and forty nine something ridiculously high like that. Yeah. And every we, people looked at it like oh. This is awesome. It's Thunderbolt. It's got Drobo technology in there. It does the raid and all this, you know, this self-healing stuff. And it's fast and it's a new industrial design. And then, you know, sort of the 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 sad music played when they got to the price because it was like seven hundred and something crazy dollars. So they've dropped the price now to three hundred and forty-nine dollars. Where, in my opinion, where it should have been when they launched the thing. So right. that is uh, that is my pick of the week. It's the Drobo Mini. We'll link to it. And I think in many ways it's the perfect device, um, storage device to sit on your desk. Like in my house, I'm going to do a video about this in a, in a couple of days, I think. But on my desk, um, there'll be there's the Drobo Mini with with the stuff that I'm working on right now, like any videos, um, the the my the the library or my Lightroom library that I'm currently using, all that stuff, and all the projects live on this device right here. And then I have the larger Drobos that are actually in the master bedroom closet next to the the router and all that stuff. All that stuff sits in an entirely different room and that's where my library of Congress lives. So everything, all my iTunes library, all my backed up files, the archive versions of TWIP, you know, back several hundred episodes, everything lives over there. And they're so they they're not cluttering up my MacBook Pro or my existing in progress stuff. So it all sort of works together, and the Drobo Mini allows me to have all that crazy storage right here on my desktop connected at Thunderbolt speeds, while at night I run a little backup um, carbon copy cloner thing that backs everything up to the to the main Drobos over there. So it seems to be working, and it's been working for about a year or so now. So I'm uh, at least the backup piece has been working. I just introduced the Drobo Mini into the mix, so that kind of completes it completes the picture. So definitely check that out. Um, if you were looking at Drobo Mini and dismissed them because of the price, the price is now down to earth, and you know it's not on Saturn anymore. So check them out. All right, guys. Um, Wait, so what's the, what's the price that you're seeing? Three hundred and forty-nine dollars. Uh, okay. Is you that an Amazon that? price, or is that there? That's on Drobo. Go to Drobo. It's on Drobo.com. Look at that link that I put in the show notes. It'll take you right over to the page. Three forty nine. Yeah, that's six Nope, you're looking in the wrong okay. place, my friend. Three forty. All right. You find it. That's a good deal. Yeah, <laughs> that is a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, Drobo's gonna come after me with pitchforks. <laughs> Or they're gonna, they're gonna sell them at three forty nine and send me the bill, right? <laughs> for, for the difference, Good. which I will promptly ignore. Anyway, so, so uh, guys, we're at the end of the show. Um, stay tuned, listeners, if you want to check out an interview I did with the one 
and the only Rick Salmon. He and I sat down and talked about all kinds of cool stuff, um, photography related, of course, and some business related stuff. So Rick gave us a glimpse, or gave me a glimpse, and you guys uh, into a, a glimpse into his business and how he runs things and how he's able to do many things at once and maintain multiple income streams with ease. So definitely check that out. That's coming up right after we close the show up. And to do that, let's just close it up with uh, Valerie. Valerie, where would you like people to go to check out the Fuji X100S <laughs> shots that you're doing all the time? No, I, I will be using my Canon again, no fear, <laughs> um, eventually. Um, I My website, uh, valeriejardinphotography.com, V-A-L-E-R-I-E-J-A-R-D-I-N, photography, all in one word. It is so easy for you to say your last name. It's, <laughs> but sure yeah, before we before I dialed you guys up on, on Google Plus, I'm like, Jardin, Jardin, Jardin. <laughs> how, how do I say that? <laughs> I just I don't have the words in my mouth to make those French words. <laughs> it's Jardin. Jardin. See? Jardin. It's like Boca. Jardin. <laughs> Boca. 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 Jardin. You know, it's just. <laughs> Bane of my existence, see? Anyway, Valerie, thank you for coming thank on you. the show. All right, Ron Brinkman, where would you like people to go to keep up with you? Oh, probably the easiest thing is still on Twitter when I managed to get on there, which is just uh, at Ron Brinkman. Are you going to be Twittering and tweeting from the altar? Oh, I doubt that. <laughs> I doubt that very much. <laughs> what, about, what about at the honeymoon? Are you going to send us Instagram photos from the honeymoon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, I don't, we haven't even managed to plan the uh, honeymoon yet, so I don't even know where it's going to be. Uh, yeah. like, we'll, we'll need to see a, a photo of the photographer in action so that we know what they're shooting with. <laughs> you know, Valerie, I'm sorry, <laughs> right. but I do not need know. to see a photo of Ron Brinkman in action on his honeymoon. Sorry. No, of the photographer. <laughs> I don't need that. I don't need that in my visual memory. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Well, thank you both for coming on. Um, listeners, if you want to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can check us out at thisweekinphoto.com. And remember, please join our community over on Google+. And finally, if you're looking for me, Frederick Van Johnson, you can find me at frederickvan.com. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off.